Tonight's uh, talk is all, all about ichthyosaurus. In recent weeks, we've had lots of geochemistry, and last time you even had to put up with me talking about geological conservation. But tonight, it's some um, good old paleontology. Um, we've got Dean Lomax with us, who is an honorary visiting scientist, brackets, paleontologist, at, uh, <laughs> at uh, the University of Manchester. Um, so over, over to you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by all things paleontology. Dinosaurs and code just sparked my imagination. But now I've been working professionally as a paleontologist for roughly about nine years. Now in that time, I've worked on a variety of different fossil groups, from ammonites to horseshoe crabs to trackways. But most of my academic research has been focused on ichthyosaurs, specifically ichthyosaurus. So this talk is to give you an, an, an insight into my academic research on ichthyosaurs and about the incredible ichthyosaurus, because it is such a fantastic genus. I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of ichthyosaurus. First of all, before I go into specifically my research, we should have a little bit of an introduction to the history of ichthyosaurs and exactly what they are. Now, essentially, it all starts with a discovery, but perhaps in the case of ichthyosaurs, it should be this, a tongue twister. <laughs> so literally, let, let's just see a raise of hands. Who's heard of this? <laughs> OK, everybody, everybody, of course. So as a young lad, I remember in school being taught of this, uh, this, this tongue twist. I'm not going to attempt this because I will fail. So I'm not going to do that. But amazingly, it's said that this tongue twister is inspired by somebody who's quite fantastic and somebody who was a bit of a hero to me. That person is Mary Anning. Now, hopefully, everybody in this room has heard of it, Mary Anning. You passed her on the way in. There's a portrait of Mary Anning. And there's also an ichthyosaur found by Mary Anning in the, in the reception area. Well, Mary Anning lived in Lyme Regis in Dorset, and she made amazing discoveries. The first at which is when she was 11, 12 years old. But obviously before that, as a, as a little girl, her father must have taken her out on the beach, and she must have collected ammonites, belemnites, and, and other fossils. But her first major discovery is when she was 11, 12 years old. Phenomenal. She placed Lyme Regis, and indeed Britain, on the map for paleontology. Through the discoveries of Mary, it really paved the way for the science of paleontology in the, in the British Isles to really kickstart the science. And there's so many people fascinated by paleontology and the study of geology through Mary's discoveries. And the first very big discovery was this thing. Now, it wasn't found by, by Mary. It was actually found by her brother, this skull. It's a skull of an ichthyosaur. Her brother Joseph had found this, and a year later, Mary actually found the rest of the skeleton. This specimen is on display at the Natural History Museum here in London. Who's seen this specimen? Okay, most of you. <coughs> at the time, these things weren't identified as ichthyosaurs. They were thought to be giant fish, perhaps crocodiles, and in fact, isolated vertebrae or even misidentified as those of humans left behind in the biblical flood. <laughs> but this discovery changed a lot of things. Now, Sir Everett Home, in 1814, wrote a paper, some account of the fossil remains of an animal more nearly allied to fishes than any of the other classes of animals. This is based specifically on, on this skull. Now, he wasn't sure exactly what it was, but he realized it was something quite unusual. And the, the link was between fish and crocodiles. But he didn't come to the conclusion that this thing was indeed a reptile. But what we need to figure out is what exactly an ichthyosaur is. So although we know it's a reptile, it's definitely not a swimming dinosaur. It's not a crocodile. <laughs> it's not a dolphin. Look a little bit like dolphins. It's also not a shark, even though they look a little bit like sharks as well. It's neither of those. Now, ichthyosaurs 
when, tra when translated from Greek, translates to fish lizards, and neither fish or lizards, not very helpful. <laughs> but indeed, they are reptiles that swam in the oceans. There are a couple of living marine reptiles. There's four, in fact. There's the saltwater crocodile. There's marine iguanas. There's various different species of sea snake and sea turtles as well. They are, ichthyosaurs are secondarily aquatic, meaning that originally their ancestors emerged from the oceans onto land and then have returned back to the ocean. They also gave birth to live young. So reptiles, we often think of reptiles as, as laying eggs and see, obviously giving birth to live young, you have various mammals. The, the scientific term, the word is viviparity, to, to physically give birth to live young. Various mammals there. And the opposite, oviparity, is to lay eggs. So you obviously birds lay eggs and crocodiles, alligators, and, and various, uh, various snakes. But that's what we see as, as obviously as reptiles, as birds, uh, crocodiles, and, and snakes, that they lay eggs. But ichthyosaurs gave birth. And here's an example of one specimen for, collected from the very famous Posidonia shale of the Holzmarden areas in Germany, a thing called Stenopterygius quadricissus. Now, lots of specimens have been found with embryos inside. But for a very long time, it was thought that these things weren't embryos. They thought that ichthyosaurs were cannibalistic and that they were constantly eating these little babies until various specimens like this one were found with an embryo which had essentially uh, been, been found and given birth. And perhaps what had happened is maybe the ichthyosaur had pot potentially died in life, um, perhaps due to the baby being stuck, and it would disease the ichthyosaur, infected her, and she must have died, which is a terrible and sad story, but it provides us with a lot of information about ichthyosaurs. So we know that they didn't lay eggs. And now you can pinpoint the embryo, the one specimen, which is clearly stuck, but also in here, there's a whole bunch of other tiny embryos. In fact, there's five individual embryos inside this, uh, in this specimen. Now, one important thing as well take away, to take away with you here is that every time, because I, I cannot stand this, every time ichthyosaurs are called swimming dinosaurs, you make one cry. So just remember that, not swimming dinosaurs. So when did ichthyosaurs live? Well, ichthyopterygia, which is the group that includes ichthyosaurs and their closest relatives, they appeared approximately about 248 million years ago, at the very early portion of the Triassic period. They became extinct about 90 million years ago, towards the end of the Cretaceous period. And they ranged in size quite immensely. They, some species grew to size of about one meter in length, whereas the largest thing called Shastasaurus, this big thing up here, grew to lengths of around 15 to 21 meters. A huge, huge animal. Now, if we go to the beginning, now this is the beginning of Ichthyosaurus. This is a, another scientific paper, and this is basically the foundation of studies of Ichthyosaurus. And this was written by Henry de la Biche and William Coneybear. And this is notice of the discovery of a new fossil animal forming a link between the Ichthyosaurus and crocodile, together with general remarks on the osteology of the Ichthyosaurus. Now, the word Ichthyosaurus had been in use for many years, but this was the very first time where it was actually in print. And so Ichthyosaurus was the first Ichthyosaur to be described officially anywhere in the world, in the, in the sense that it had already been in discussion, and this was where it is in print, and it's specifically to a bunch of specimens. And furthermore, the very first species of Ichthyosaurus was also described in this paper, a thing called Ichthyosaurus communis. Now, there's a problem with Ichthyosaurus, and this stems all the way back to that discovery of, uh, of Joseph Anning and various other specimens in that Ichthyosaurus communis, when described by Dillabish and Coney Bear, they decided that, it was, uh, that their description was based on a series of measurements of a specimen. They didn't exactly suggest and study one specific specimen. It was a bunch of specimens. And so they didn't select a holotype specimen. And so no unique features were mentioned, no illustration of that specimen exists. And indeed, it's regarded as the holotype, but the specimen cannot currently be located. And is actual fact presumed destroyed. 
A year later, Coney Bear had another paper published, and there was some definition of ichthyosaurus, but this was all largely based on teeth. He described four different species on the basis of teeth. He illustrated skulls, which sadly are also now lost. The result is that ichthyosaurus became what is known as a wastebasket taxon, which is not good. Essentially, a wastebasket taxon is where if you have a bunch of ichthyosaurs and you can't figure out where they go, it, they just go to ichthyosaurus. That's the problem. Over 50 species were assigned to ichthyosaurus before 1900 and even more later. This creates many, many problems, and just a couple of those included this. Ichthyosaurus, by default, had a global distribution. It was found pretty much all across the world. And it had a super long stratigraphic range. These are real issues for a paleontologist trying to understand what exactly Ichthyosaurus constitutes. And by default, because it became a wastebasket taxon, Ichthyosaurus was super variable. Now, the solution was that during the early and mid-19th century, various new discoveries were made, and there were new genera described. So there's various new, new genus. Paleontologists re-examined Ichthyosaurus during the, the 1800s, but it wasn't until relatively recently that a fantastic paleontologist, Chris McGowan, in 1974, basically reviewed lots of Ichthyosaurus specimens, went through the literature, and he de determined that only four species were valid, although he misidentified one and later that was assigned to a different genus. He assigned for the missing holotype of Ichthyosaurus communis, he assigned a neotype. That specimen is now on display at the Natural History Museum. And essentially, McGowan redefined the genus and you know, potentially had a solution here. But it's never that easy. As defined by McGowan, although he did a splendid job, Ichthyosaurus comprised... In short, Ichthyosaurus breviceps, which he suggested was a short snout of species, Ichthyosaurus coni bearai, which was determined to be a, a long snout of species, and everything else was Ichthyosaurus communis. And this was almost largely based on, on ratios. It also meant that all lower Jurassic Ichthyosaurs with a wide paddle and an anterior digital bifurcation were all referable to Ichthyosaurus. Now, anterior digital bifurcation may not be familiar with, with some of you here. I know some of you in the audience are aware of what that means. But an anterior digital bifurcation is super cool for ichthyosaurs. I've highlighted this blue thing here. This is an extra digit in the flipper, in the forefin of an ichthyosaur. And ichthyosaurus is unique at present in having an anterior bifurcation. And now, by anterior, this is a humerus. And this is the anterior side. And you have a bifurcation here. This is an actual extra digit, an extra finger in the forefin. And some ichthyosaurs, ichthyosaurus examples, can have up to nine individual fingers. And in fact, what's pretty cool is all these are all the individual phalanges as well. And in fact, some species can have up to 25 individual phalanges in one forefin. So that's what makes ichthyosaurus unique based on McGowan. And also, based on this, he suggested there was two populations of ichthyosaurus communis that differed quite substantially in forefin structure. One population from Somerset, one population from Dorset, which sadly equals still poorly defined. Now, this brings me to my first encounter. Now, this didn't necessarily happen here in the UK, no. What's interesting for me, this is really a story of serendipity, because when I was 18... I raised up enough money to go out to America to work with a fantastic museum called the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. And so this picture is literally in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming. And we were excavating this, which doesn't look like much, but I'll explain what it is in a moment. But perhaps the most important thing for me is that I bumped into these two paleontologists, Professor Judy Massere and Bill Wall, who were fantastic paleontologists, and they've done a lot of research on marine reptiles, especially ichthyosaurs. And, of course, at this point when I'm 18, I, this is my sort of first introduction to academia. I, I got chatting away to Bill and to Judy, and they got me quite interested in ichthyosaurs. And I said, oh, okay, that's, that's you know, they're, they're, they're super cool. Obviously, as a youngster, I was fascinated by all things paleontology, but ichthyosaurs, the way in which Judy and, and Bill described them, seemed really interesting. I wondered if perhaps I could study them and, and go into a career in paleontology, specifically looking at ichthyosaurs. 
Well, anyway, this discovery, uh, we, we pla gave a plaster jacket, so I'm, I'm not sure if you'll be familiar with this, but if any of you have ever broken a bone and you have a, a plaster a pot on, this is essentially what we do with, with fossils in the field as well. So here, the specimen, we had literally cut, cut the rock away from the specimen, pivoted it, and then put plaster all around and eventually flipped it, and we took it back to the museum, and it was eventually prepared, and this is a huge flipper, it's a huge forefin from a pliosaur. There's a thing called Megalnusaurus rex. It's from the late Jurassic. Well, after my time in Wyoming, I came home, and I'm originally from Doncaster. And as a child, I used to visit Doncaster Museum and Art Gallery, but they never had any fossils on display. And they didn't have a, a geologist either, or a paleontologist when I was a youngster, so they mostly dealt with ar archaeology. And so I just assumed that they had no fossils. But anyway, I decided to contact the museum. And as it turns out, uh, an archaeologist there, Peter Robinson, had said to me, oh, we actually do have a collection of fossils, and it's worthwhile your time coming in here to see what we've got. So I went ahead, went into the museum, and to my surprise, these few fossils, which I assumed would just be a couple of ammonites or belemnites, turned out to be 12,000 specimens, <laughs> which was, uh, I was yeah, pretty, pretty shocked by that. And as part of this time, I began volunteering with the museum, and we created this temporary exhibition. But most importantly, this specimen was also in the museum. But I, it's an ichthyosaurus, but I like to call it something else. Nobody saw us. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that, this specimen had been sort of hidden behind the scenes. It was in the education department of the museum. And to cut the story short, the specimen ended up being originally accessioned into the museum collection, but it went into the education, and it ended up being misidentified as a plaster cast instead of a real specimen. And so when I came along, I'm still 18 at this point, I met the then education officer, and he said to me, oh, you know, you're working on this mini exhibition. We could show you this ichthyosaur cast we've got in the back. So I said, sure, yeah, maybe we could use that. So I went into the back rooms, and he said, oh, this is a cast. And I looked, I said, oh, no, no, this is real. This is a real specimen. And he said, oh, it can't be, it can't be. You know, we've been using this for years here. I said, no, no, this is real. And so we had it verified, and everybody agreed that I was, I was correct, and it was a real specimen. Now, this actually ended up forming my first peer-reviewed paper. So after examining this specimen, I got back in touch with Judy Macera and Bill Wall, and they encouraged me to, to write an academic paper. And I, in actual fact, the year later, 2009, I also went back out to Wyoming, where also Judy and Bill were, were there again, and I got chatting about this specimen, and eventually it was published in 2010. Now, the important thing with this specimen is that because it had been misidentified as a plaster cast, there was no information readily available with it. So we had to delve through all the record books in the museum and figure out exactly where this thing came from. But to our help was this little bellum knife. So there's this fossil here, these squid-like creatures. That was lying in the matrix in the rock near the skull. And that bellum knife is found in only one particular bed and horizon anywhere in the world, and that's on the Dorset coast. So we knew exactly, roughly, where it came from. And so it ended up that the fact that it came from Charmouth, which is you know, sort of Mary Anning's hunting ground, and that was really interesting in its own right, because we managed to find that this was from a, a rare horizon. Ichthyosaur remains specifically from this particular horizon, which is known as the Plainsbachian stage of the Jurassic, are quite rare, especially in the published literature. But also with this, and what formed my first paper, is the fact that there was a fish scale preserved and lots of these tiny hooklets. And these are all preserved in that dark mass you can see. And what those tiny hooklets are, are from the arms of squid. And so we know that this ichthyosaur, about 189 million years ago, when it was swimming around, was feeding on fish and squid before it died. And that was based on my, my first paper. Now, during that year, so this was 2010 as the paper was published, the title here, Research, Research, Travel, Travel, because, because for this, in 2010, Judy Macera and I joined forces. And what we decided we wanted to do, because we looked at the ichthyosaur, at Doncaster in quite some detail, and we decided that actually might be quite unusual, could potentially be a new species. But what we planned to do is to describe the Doncaster ichthyosaur in detail. But the problem is, how do we tackle the taxonomic nightmare of what ichthyosaurus is? And the answer to that is, we needed to research so much material to go through all of the literature, but we had to physically go and see specimens. 
And essentially, that meant visiting museums, institutions, private collections, present research at conferences, and publish our research. Now, in short, up to press, I've literally examined ichthyosaurs about several thousand specimens since 2010. And that was in light of do, dealing with the taxonomic nightmare of ichthyosaurus. So we literally had to see a lot of material. And as part of this, it's pretty cool thing was the fact that we had the opportunity to go and rediscover hidden gems in museums. So we wanted to look at museum and university collections, but also look at specimens in minor museum collections as well. So not the usual Natural History Museum, Oxford University Museum, or Sedgwick Museum. We wanted to visit museums that are sort of off the radar for fossils. Museums like Doncaster, which may also have oddities behind the scenes. So we wanted to visit those sort of museums too. And anyway, although this specimen was actually in the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge, this is a super cool specimen, one of these hidden gems. This is a very interesting fossil for various reasons. It was collected by Mary Anning, and it was purchased by Adam Sedgwick of the Sedgwick Museum in 1832. Now, this specimen had been in the literature very, very briefly. There was a paper written 30, 40 years ago about this, but not in any scientific capacity. It was about the history behind the specimen and Mary Anning's discovery of it and letters between... Mary and Adam. But when me and Judy began this tour of museum collections, we came across this one behind the scenes at the Sedgwick Museum. And by chance, we noted that this turns out it was a species, an example of Ichthyosaurus breviceps, this so called short snouted species. And what it turned out is that this was the most complete example of Ichthyosaurus breviceps known. It was the first time that the pelvis, so you have here, this is the ischium and the pubis, and then you have the ilium. It's the first time the, the pelvis is known for this species, and it was also the largest example of this species known, so a really rare find. We also have to be very careful as plain paleontologists because we have to play fossil detective as well. By this, I mean, <coughs> during the early mid-19th century, through discoveries by Mary Anning and various other collectors, ichthyosaurs and co. weren't necessarily examined for their scientific detail in any great capacity because the science had really just begun and a lot of people were getting interested in it. Many collectors were after specimens as natural pieces of artwork. So this picture is from a collector called Charles Moore, who collected a fantastic bunch of ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and other fossils, mostly from Somerset. You can see that he's, he's had them displayed here and sort of in all their glory. And they're, to some extent, seen as natural pieces of art. Now, a problem occurs with this because if you all take a look at that specimen, it looks pretty fine, a pretty good ichthyosaur. But there's a lot of problems with this. First and foremost, the entire skull is carved. It's all made of plaster, bar a couple of teeth. The forefin and the coracoid are also made of plaster. They're probably copies from an original specimen, which I don't know where that original specimen is, but they've been added to this thing. The only real and useful portions of this skeleton are the hind fins and the pelvis. But more alarmingly with this is if we look at the tail, in fact, the entire vertebral column, I'll go back one, the entire vertebral column, there's a really weird bend that doesn't look right. And the reason it doesn't look right is because these vertebrae have been added from everywhere. Now, this image, which I've shown, is, is meant to be dorsal vertebrae, back vertebrae. All of the vertebrae here are actually tail vertebrae in place of dorsals. And this happened, this is actually a relatively recent specimen, and this is actually an ongoing study of mine. And in fact, more alarmingly to this thing, the interesting thing about it is that the bit that circled was collected at Lyme Regis, but it's all been set into a Holzmarden Germany block of matrix, and that's the first time anywhere that you've had an ichthyosaur from one country and another country put together. So it's not a very good one at all. But historically, because you had many collectors collecting specimens of pieces of artwork, there was no problem of having a vertebral column, and adding a fin to it, adding a skull to it to make it look more complete. But the issue is then, when we look at these things, which we term composites, it's a problem, because then scientists, if you're unaware of it being a composite, you could examine it as 100% genuine, write up your results, have them published, and then that's in the scientific literature. And that has happened quite a lot. So you've got to be very, very careful. Now, going back to the Doncaster ichthyosaur, 
to like, what I like to call Operation XD. So the gentleman here in the picture with me is Nigel Larkin, a very prolific paleontologist. Well, Nigel was tasked with this mini operation of looking at the forefin of Ichthyosaurus, uh, this Ichthyosaurus at Doncaster Museum. And what we wanted to do was remove all of this bit which has been outlined here, which is what Nigel did, so that we could examine the humerus bone, the upper bone of the, the forefin, in 3D to see how unusual it was in comparison to other ichthyosaurus. So we did that, and we were able to establish that it was indeed a new species based on various different features. And so because Mary Anning was a bit of a hero of mine growing up, I'd read about Mary, and also, again, working with Judy Massere, we decided between the two of us that we would name this new species after Mary. So in, in her honour, we call this Ichthyosaurus anningae, which translates to Mary Anning's fish lizard. It was the first ichthyosaur ever to be named after Mary, despite Mary bringing ichthyosaurs to the attention of the scientific world. Now, as part of that study, we also identified five specimens in total of this species, including this specimen, which quite, again, serendipitously, this was actually collected by Mary Anning, and it's an example of Ichthyosaurus anningae. Now, comparing that specimen with the Doncaster specimen, it basically had all the same features, but the humerus bones were slightly different. And so what we looked at is the prospect of this showing sexual dimorphism, i.e. males and females. So was, for example, the larger humerus here, this thing here, was that of a, of a male? And was the smaller one, this one, of a, of a female? So we discussed this in the, in the literature and proposed that potentially it could be a female versus male thing, which is, for the very first time, put together and studied on, on ichthyosaurs. So another paper of mine was looking at the largest example of ichthyosaurus. Now, ichthyosaurus length, at present, ichthyosaurus communis is just over two meters in length from tip of snout to end of tail. Ichthyosaurus breviceps is just a little bit shorter than two meters. Ichthyosaurus coni is less than 1.5 meters. And ichthyosaurus anningae is just less than two meters. Well, we looked at this specimen, which is an isolated forefin. I've got a copy of this. This is an exact copy of the specimen. Now, the humerus is roughly about 12 centimetres long. That's the largest humerus of any ichthyosaurus on record, but all we have is this one specimen. So what we decided to do was to undertake a bunch of regression analyses and compare this to another 100 ichthyosaurus humeri and compare their skull with the humerus in 25 specimens and the humerus with the vertebral column in 25 specimens, and it would suggest that this individual had a snout to end of tail length, total length, of approximately three metres. So this forefin belongs to, at present, the largest ichthyosaurus so far discovered. Now also, another project of mine was looking at Nottinghamshire ichthyosaurs. So as part of my role at the University of Manchester, I'm a specialist advisor for various different students. And for an undergraduate dissertation, I tasked a student, a young chap called Ben Gibson, who's a fantastic student, the, 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 the long shot of basically going through the entire literature and visiting various different museums to record all Nottinghamshire ichthyosaurs. Now, this new study essentially compiled every single known specimen of an ichthyosaur ever collected from Nottinghamshire, ranging from isolated bones to complete skeletons. And Ben managed to find 67 specimens, which was an amazing, amazing accomplishment because in the literature, there's only very few records of ichthyosaurs from Nottinghamshire. Now, this was the first definitive occurrence of ichthyosaurus from the county. And it was also a paper of mine and Ben's that was published in PGA. And these bones here, this is the portion of forefin, this is a humerus, this is another humerus, and they all belong to Ichthyosaurus. But also we had some isolated skulls that belong to Ichthyosaurus, and also partial skeletons, including this specimen. Another study was a fresh look at Ichthyosaurus coni bearai. So, a little bit of background about Coney Bear. It was described by Lydica in 1888. It was defined as a new species on the basis of a very small skeleton, a very fragmentary skeleton, I should add as well, as this thing on display at the Natural History Museum here in London. And it was based essentially on having this long, delicate snout, and it had this thing called notching on the forefin, and I've highlighted here with the arrows this notching, where there's literally a sort of 
excuse me, semicircular notch taken out of the anterior portion of the forefin, the leading edge of the forefin. And for those reasons, this was established as a new species. And all the way up until Chris McGowan in 1974, he also agreed that it was a new species as well. So he'd referred another specimen, in fact, to Coney Bear, right? And he also used these ratios of snout length to further distinguish the species. So he was quite comfortable and confident that it was a valid species in comparison to Communis and Breviceps at the time. But issues still remained. So again, working with Judy, we looked at Coney Bear, right? And at the time, prior to the discovery and description of Ichthyosaurus aninae, it was the best defined species. But characters used to define the species, they overlapped and didn't necessarily suggest a distinct species. So again, it could come under that umbrella of variation within what is called communis. And so we determined that Coney Bear was, was a questionable species that needed re-evaluation. And so enter the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. And a new specimen, or well, sort of a new specimen. Now this thing is an excellent little little beastie. It's only a baby, juvenile, not very long. It was collected during the 1980s from Doniford Bay in Watchet in Somerset, and it's purchased by the National Museum of Wales in 1992. Now, the funny thing is, it, during the 90s, the specimen went on display at the National Museum of Wales, but nobody ever looked at this. Nobody ever studied, studied the specimen. So it wasn't until me and Judy, again, on one of our tours of the UK, visited the National Museum of Wales, looked at this for the first time and said, oh, this is really unusual. It's got some odd features. And if we compare this specimen with the one at the bottom, this one at the bottom is another specimen that Chris McGowan had referred to Ichthyosaurus coney bear, right? You can see they're very, very similar. I've added that yellow block there because we also, talking about these composites and modified specimens, we also noticed that all of this, the snout, has also been reconstructed. It's all plaster. And so we could only focus on the skull and the, and the rest of the, the skeleton. So as we re-evaluated Ichthyosaurus coney bear eye, because this new specimen had been collected relatively recently, it had very good data in terms of its geographic and stratigraphic range, so we knew precisely where it came from, in fact, what ledge it came from as well, which is excellent, which is very difficult for us to have that information from historical specimens because most of them are just simply recorded as Somerset or Dorset or another location. So it's very important. We also found that the skull... The humerus and the pelvis features are all unique for Ichthyosaurus coney bear eye. And you can compare the two skulls there. So the one on the left is the National Museum of Wales specimen, the new specimen. And the other one on the right is the specimen that McGowan in 1974 referred to the species. And so they're super, super similar. Now, another big paper of mine that was officially published this year was two new species, two centuries of weight. So hundreds of specimens were collected from the Somerset countryside two centuries ago, a century and a half ago, and this was found in lots of quarries. And this included a beautiful specimen, this one, which is something that we called Ichthyosaurus larkini, in honour of our colleague and friend Nigel Larkin. Now, the specimen was formerly in the collection of Joseph Channing Pierce, who was a prolific fossil hunter during the 19th century, amassed an amazing fossil collection, one of the best in the UK at the time. And the specimen was originally sold in 1915 to Bristol Museum. It was then donated to the University of Bristol in 1930, where it essentially went on display. And once again, nobody really looked at this thing in any great detail. And it, was, it wasn't until Judy and I looked at this specimen and again determined that it was something unusual. I managed to find multiple examples of this thing. Now, the second species that we called... Ichthyosaurus somersetensis, in honour of Somerset, is also has a very interesting and unusual story because it was likely collected from Glastonbury in the 1840s. It was sold at auction in Bristol to Edward Wilson of Tenby, Wales, and Edward sent this specimen to Delaware, USA, for his brother, Dr Thomas Wilson, who then donated this specimen to Philadelphia's Academy of Natural Sciences in 1847. So Judy was doing something quite similar to what I was over here in the UK, contacting various museums. And Judy had spoken to the Academy of Natural Sciences and just sent a generic email saying, do you have any ichthyosaurs? And they said, oh, yeah, we've got this complete thing from Glastonbury in England. She had no idea why would an ichthyosaur from Glastonbury in England be in the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And so we went to examine this specimen. 
Judy went a couple of times and I went uh, last year. And in my opinion, it's one of, if not the best example of ichthyosaurus ever found. It's a beautiful, beautiful fossil. And looking at ichthyosaurus larkini, so this is the skull at the top is larkini. In the middle is Somersetensis. And at the bottom is the neotype specimen of ichthyosaurus communis. There are various differences in the skulls. So the bones in the skulls are very different, and so we, we establish that already there is differences there and therefore probably represented a new species. But also, in other parts of the skeleton, we add in the humerus bone. So here are the humerus bone, the humeri of all six species of ichthyosaurus, Larkini, Somersetensis, Communis, Breviceps, Coneybearae, and Aninge, and you can see how they all differ. And then one very recent paper, the most recently published paper of mine on ichthyosaurs, is where we looked at two species, and essentially they became one. So there's a bit of a controversy with this, actually, in that the one species is that McGowan, 1974, and McGowan and Matani actually think it's one species, and two species are Appleby, 1979, Mace, 97, and Mace and Matska, 2000. So these sort of two camps who say that there's one species and that there's two species. Well, the one species would just be Ichthyosaurus communis. The two species is Ichthyosaurus communis and a thing called Ichthyosaurus intermedius. That was described way back in 1822, but just on tooth form. So if we looked at this, these two illustrations, this is from Coney Bear, 1822. So when he described four new species, two of them, sorry, three new species, one of them he looked at the tooth form of Ichthyosaurus communis, which he illustrated, but he looked at the tooth form of this thing intermedius. You can see there's some slight differences there. And he noted specifically that Intermedius had a tooth that was more acutely conical, more slender, it had less striations, that were, sorry, striations less prominent, and less prominent root striations. So he thought these features were enough to separate these individuals, and then therefore they were two distinct species. And that's where the controversy comes in. Because we've been able to now, since 1822, we've looked at more specimens, there's lots of ichthyosaurs, we managed to find in ichthyosaurs, in, in various different groups, the tooth form varies ontogenetically. So it varies with age. So from babies to adults, the tooth form is rather different. The apparent morphology of the teeth varies within orientation and degree of preparation on a slab mount, that is, on a specimen in a large frame, like some of those I've been showing you. It can change. So if you look at it directly from the side, from above, from the from the left side, right side, so on and so forth, from underneath, they can change. And another problem, perhaps the most alarming, is that tooth form varies within an individual. So if we look at this specimen, we have a bit of a, a snout. So we look at that tooth. That tooth has the form, roughly, of Ichthyosaurus communis. Can you agree? But if we look at this tooth, this has the form, roughly, of Ichthyosaurus intermediate. So you've got these two, two tooth forms forms already in one specimen, but then even more so, there's a third. If you look at this tooth, it's very different to those. And so you've got to be very, very cautious when you look at these things. And so me and Judy began to look back again at the differences between Ichthyosaurus intermedius and Communis, including this, the fact that tooth form varies within an individual. And we compared the, the so-called types. So in Ichthyosaurus intermedius, although it was described in 1822 and we cannot find the original specimen, it was illustrated, and this is the illustration on the left of the original specimen. It's said to be in the Oxford Museum of Natural History, but we've not managed to locate it. And we compared also with Ichthyosaurus communis, the neotype specimen designated by McGowan in 1974. And what we did, although we sort of identified that the variation in tooth form was quite clearly variable, we also looked at various different features in the skull. So again, we looked at the various different bones, we looked at the shape of the orbit, so on and so forth. And we also looked at other portions of the skeleton. But what we determined is that essentially, Ichthyosaurus intermedius is Ichthyosaurus communis. They're the two of the same. But a problem occurred is that when you go way back to Coney Bear in 1822, when he was describing this material, there wasn't that much to look at. And so these variations were just quite to him, quite alarming. But now you can look at so much more material, you can see that it's a, it's a continuum of variation. And so essentially the result is that these two species are the same. Now, one thing that I'm really passionate about, I, I'm sure some of you are aware, is that 
I'm really passionate about science communication. So I'm, I'm always happy to talk about my research at public events, at talks like this, media, and so on and so forth. And many of my research papers, uh, I like to share them publicly as well, and, and again, talk about them in the public eye. And one issue you come up against as a, as a paleontologist, I guess as a scientist or anybody trying to get something into the public eye, is that you get journalists who are just not willing to budge on their ideas and what they want to say. And a few years ago, when I was trying to talk about Ichthyosaurus aninge, I wanted to tell the story about aninge and send it out to the press. The one particular journalist said to me this line, so I'll just take a moment to read this. <laughs> and so I didn't quite know what to say. And, and the funny thing for me is although this is quite offensive to paleontologists, is, is I, I literally used to think this, you know, if, if they are called swimming dinosaurs, why do they look more like fish? You know, that should be the question that they're asking, but they don't. And so it, it's really important that we talk about, as a paleontologist, as a scientist, that we do share our, our, our science with the public. It is really important. And sometimes you can get difficult journalists who, who deal with these things. Now, the, the funny old thing with this is the fact when the paper was published and it was announced... Ichthyosaur the story of Ichthyosaurus anime went all across the world. I had colleagues of mine contacting me from the USA, from Asia, saying, oh, we've heard about this in the news. And so it just goes to show that you don't have to call these things a swimming dinosaur. And so conclusions at the moment with my, with my research is that there is a detailed revision of Ichthyosaurus ongoing. I'm still doing lots and lots of research. You can quite clearly see that Ichthyosaurus communis is no longer a wastebasket tax. And we've spent a lot of time going over all of the original Ichthyosaurus communis material. We've compared it to various other specimens. And, of course, we've determined that three new species of Ichthyosaurus have been described. And those new species have been brought to life out of the so-called variation of Ichthyosaurus communis. So when McGowan and others, not just McGowan, have said that the species communis is super variable, we've been able to pinpoint that actually the variability is based on, if you look at a mass of specimens, thousands of specimens and hundreds of really good complete skeletons, if you can pick out features in the skull, in the forefin, in the hindfin and other areas, you can work out that these things are definitely distinct. But in, it's often that you need almost a complete skeleton to be able to 100% assign it to a species. We've also looked at Ichthyosaurus breviceps and Ichthyosaurus coniberi, and we, we've redefined them in part. And ichthyosaurus size has also been re-estimated too. So what next for me? So as it stands right now, I've got quite a lot of other interesting projects ongoing, specifically on ichthyosaurs and ichthyosaurus. And perhaps in, I would suggest, two or probably three months, we hopefully there will be a press release got about a new paper of mine that resurrects an ichthyosaur as described several years ago, and it was cast aside uh, unjustifiably, I might add, by various workers who thought that it was just variation of Ichthyosaurus. But as it turns out, this thing isn't just variation. It was one of these composite Ichthyosaurs, whereby, historically, during the early 1800s, somebody had played about with these Ichthyosaurs, made one more complete than what it was actually, and it's taken that length of time to eventually that the specimen has been damaged and luckily for us, we've been able to look at it in greater detail because of the damage and determine that these are composites. So we're going to be resurrecting another ichthyosaur genus from the early Jurassic. And aside from that, I've got lots of other ongoing projects. One of them is looking at the ontogeny of ichthyosaurus. We're looking at the sample size of many little ichthyosaurus specimens. There's about 25, 30 specimens we're looking at. And we're trying to nail down the species. So if we can determine a, a little baby as a species of, say, communis or larkini or whatever, then we're seeing how it changes onto, onto genetically. So as a baby, what happens? What changes? Does the skull get much larger? Does the humerus get larger, longer, wider, so on? And then another project, although I've talked about this one being the largest, Another scientific paper of mine, which hopefully should be out as well in a couple of months' time, is also looking at another very large ichthyosaurus, which is potentially larger than this thing. And it's very unusual in that it's the third example of that particular species of ichthyosaurus with an embryo as well, and it was collected in Somerset. And so finally, I've got a bunch of acknowledgments which I'd like to, uh, to show. And also, I should point out UCAF there. It stands for the United Kingdom Amateur Fossil Hunters. I'm the patron of UCAF. And I would, if, if any of you would like to go out fossil hunting and so on, I'd very much recommend that you 
check out UCAF and, and join up with them. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Dean. Re really fascinating and a, a good reminder of how much important work tidying up sort of taxonomy that can be done just by looking at existing specimens in collections. You haven't got to be going out and digging them up yourselves. There's still plenty of work to be done with what has been collected. Okay, have we got any questions? We've got one with Mike there. Um, yeah, very nice. I'll uh, wait for the microphone, please, Mike. Yeah, a very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Um, the species that you've been able to identify, do they have, uh, are you able to uh, assess the range of them? Do they have different ranges, overlapping ranges? Can you comment on that? Yeah, so it's a really good question. The, the downside we've got is that because many of them are from historical collections, all we have really to go on is that if we, if, even if we have the collector's information, we just have Somerset streets in Somerset or maybe Lyme, Re Lyme Regis, Dorset. That's really it. So we don't have much data in terms of exactly the horizons where these things come from. Presumably, we do think that at least we know Ichthyosaurus aninge uh, lived during the Plains Bacchian portion of the Jurassic and perhaps earlier. But we do know specifically that that came from the Plains Bacchian. And because Ichthyosaurs are rare there, that, that does suggest that that particular species was at least in the Plains Bacchian. But the others, they have a range of earliest Jurassic Catangian through to potentially through Plains Bacchian. We just don't know. The Somerset material historically had been regarded as uppermost Triassic, and it straddled the boundary between the Triassic and the Jurassic into the, the Hatangian. But again, that's kind of up in the air. So that's one of our issues, really. Ideally, with a study like this, it would be great to be able to say specimen A, B, C, D, and E came from this location, this horizon, and so you could have a much better understanding of the stratigraphic range. And that's, it's one of the disappointing things, I guess, one of the downfalls of working with historical specimens is that we don't have that data. Okay, anybody else? Wait, wait, wait a minute, I'll do that. Hi, Dean. Uh, you seem to be dealing with quite a lot of fakes and made-up bits and patched-together bits. Are you allowed to take them apart, get rid of all the junk, and look at the actual science? Because beneath that plast, there might be even more interesting material. Uh, yeah. Do they, museums want to keep their nice-looking bit of junk or get to the science <laughs> underneath it? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a good one. The <laughs> way to answer that, the, the problem is, is that because many of these things are historical specimens, they have that historical significance. And because, say, as a specimen, say, I don't know, collected by Thomas Hawkins, who is you know, notorious for doing these composites, and again, perhaps not for, for deceptive purposes, or maybe, maybe so, I don't know, but presumably not for deceptive purposes, because it's historical specimen, you've got that significance with it. Most museums, especially the Natural History Museum, would be adverse to having it taken apart and just having the real specimens uh, left. And, and in fact, I should point out that one example, which was taken apart, <laughs> thought to be a copy, it turns out it was real. <laughs> so we had a beautiful skeleton in a frame, they took it apart, and it was, yeah, it was all real. So then it's like, yeah, we can't display that now. <laughs> It's too bad, but yeah, that's one of the issues. You didn't do that, did you? No, no, it wasn't me, no, no. That paleontologist will remain anonymous. <laughs> John. Can you hear me? I mean, you make it sound as if the exosols are, are prolific, as if there are hundreds of, of skeletons. And oh, oh. Also, do they interbreed? What's that, sorry? Did they interbreed? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know if they in, interbred. I don't know, pr presumably so. But if they interbred, you, you, you smudge the difference between them. Yeah, yeah, exactly, pr presumably so. But um, to answer your first part of your question, yeah, there is literally thousands of ichthyosaurs <coughs> known, and especially in the UK, there's thousands known from the Dorset coast, coll collectively from Dorset, Somerset primarily, but also you've had ichthyosaurs found all across the UK, from as far north, far north as the Isle of Skye, so even on the Isle of Wight, there's been some ichthyosaurs found in the Cretaceous. And they're very, very, I'd say probably, in fact, as a Jurassic, a good point would be for you is that ichthyosaurs are the most common vertebrate fossil found, uh, reptile found, so, which, is, which is quite amazing. And ichthyosaurs in general have been found on every continent, you know, even in, um, in, in, in New Zealand and Antarctica and so on. So, yeah, they're, they're very common as fossils. <laughs> 
Uh, Mike, again, if we've got no... Um, you mentioned early on that um, uh, these uh, evolved from land animals. Mm. Do we know anything about what land animal they were derived from? Again, uh, sadly not. No, we, we don't. So that's kind of a bit of an enigma in, uh, in, in paleontology and looking at the evolutionary origins of ichthyosaurs. So there's a lot of camps of paleontologists who've been looking at ichthyosaurs for a very long time and trying to figure out exactly where they came from, their evolutionary line. And, and even today, nobody can settle on exactly where they evolved from or what exactly they are. And one of the problems with that is because we don't have sort of that direct ancestor of this is the thing that they came from. We know that because it's got this feature, this feature, this feature. And it's just, again, it's another issue. But hopefully that, will, that sort of void will be filled at some point. Uh, a wonderful talk, and thank you. Thank you. Um, you indicated in an early slide uh, that uh, they went extinct um, late Jurassic. In an, a recent answer of yours, you mentioned the Cretaceous. So when did they go extinct? No, no I, I showed that there was late Cretaceous. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Well, I'll go back to what was going to be my question in that case. Um, do we know what, uh, what was the cause of them going extinct? Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of... A lot of research recently on this, and potentially, well, sort of historically, it had been that they were outcompeted by other animals. So other groups of animals had appeared, things like mosasaurs appeared, and there was other diversity, other fish, sharks, and potentially they were outcompeted. That was p potentially uh, the reason for it. But also, recently, it was climate change. Apparently, they couldn't adapt to the environments quick enough. And that was a study that was published in one of the nature journals by a colleague of mine, Valentin Fisher very recently bringing this to our attention, and that's the sort of latest thinking. That's probably a combination of not being able to adapt to the environment quick enough in the, the new climate, but also the fact that they were probably outcompeted by other animals too. Okay, uh, yeah. Two quick questions. Uh, two quick questions. One, do the teeth have um, rings of growth like trees and like other animals, uh, like elephants and tusks? that would be there so that you could see what part of the Jurassic they might have lived in because of uh, quick growth, slow growth, because of climate change. Yeah, I mean, presumably that could be, could be done. The, the issue, again, is if you look at historical specimens, it will be a case of museums allowing you to cut these teeth up. <laughs> you have individual species, though. You could just cut it and take one sample and look pretty new. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that, that's it. You'd have to look at a, a wider range of specimens. Like, you couldn't just look at one specimen. Sure. And do you know the Triassic Museum in Mont St. Georgi in Switzerland, where they have all these Triassic ichthyosaurs? Oh, yeah, and So yeah. if you're going to think about the phylogeny, wouldn't you want to go back to the Triassic? Oh, yeah, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. Branching and then... Yeah, and then that's what's been happening for such a long time. You know, there's, there's been various groups of, of paleontologists who looked at the early Triassic material and try to figure them out. So I, I mentioned briefly about the group, the wider group Ichthyopterygia, which incorporates Ichthyosauria, which has all Ichthyosaurs, Ichthyosaurus, so on and so forth. But then there's this other close relatives. And these things are very early Triassic. They are much more similar to sort of lizards with flippers than a, as opposed to sort of the iconic sort of fish-shaped uh, Ichthyosaurs. And it's right at the beginning there is where the, sort of the origins of Ichthyosaurs come from, Ichthyopterygia. But again, at the point is, is that we don't know the sort of a direct ancestor of ichthyosaurs, and this is why it still remains a bit of an enigma to try and figure that out. Okay, yeah. uh, Dean, me again. <laughs> uh, you, you dismiss variations in the teeth as possibly ontogenetic. Yeah. And you rely a lot on the humerus, and differences in the humerus can also be ontogenetic, mm -hmm. from very gracile humeri in juveniles to yep. very robust humeri in adults, and it can be quite dramatic, mm. the, the changes. Have you ruled that out in your phylogeny? Uh, yeah, as part of our studies, we did look at this. And so, for example, if we compared Ichthyosaurus somersetensis with Ichthyosaurus communis, we looked at specimens that had sort of roughly the same humerus size, and you can see even then, there's differences in the proximal end of the humerus and the distal end, the robusti robustity, robustness of the, of the humerus as well. And you could do the same with Ichthyosaurus coni bearii, and that it has a specific humerus that is w much wider distally than proximally. And you see that again and again in the various different specimens. Uh, but you also get it within species. Our own species. Oh, yeah, within species, yeah. Blacksmiths that use their right arm a lot have much more developed humeri. <laughs> Yeah. Than the rest of us, poor computer tappers. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. We'll we'll um, we'll call a halt there. Um, Dean's around now for, for the next three quarters an hour or whatever while we have a drink. So I'm sure he'll be happy to pick up other questions. But I think he's earned his drink at this point. <laughs> the uh, the I was just going to say. I was just going to say the sort of co the issue of composites and um, um, plaster stuff's re really fascinating, isn't it? It's almost a subject it is, in yeah. itself, and yeah. uh, it's, it's it's super important as well. I mean, I showed that one example. That's literally a, a paper of mine which I've got ongoing. I've published a couple of papers on composites, but that specific specimen is in a museum in Germany, and it's intriguing because the museum had it. It was sold to them as a 100% genuine fossil. <laughs> and they paid X amount of money for it. And so when I examined this specimen, it was actually earlier this year, I told the curator that it was you know, almost entirely fake and you could see all the blood yeah, rush yeah. from his head. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he wasn't very happy. I don't know that all. I should point out as well, just before I leave, that if you haven't purchased a postcard of Mary Anning, whilst I was here, I figured, why not? 50 pence, Mary Anning? So I'm <laughs> uh, taking that, so nice blue. <laughs>